Good morning everybody, welcome back to more Sins of the Father. It is warm today, it's a lovely morning, I've just made myself a nice fresh pot of tea and uh, I am ready to read you two more chapters of this wonderful book of mine. <laughs> this one, this one right here, there you go, I'll put it on the camera. Um, yeah, I I'm in a good mood today. I ate a ridiculous amount of junk food last night, slept okay. Woke up a bit early, but I'm, I'm in a good mood. It's great. It's a nice sunny day. Take the positives where we can find them, huh? Okay, so yesterday was just a teeny tiny short little chapter. Um, a little bit of personal back and forth and dialogue between Martha and her aunt. And uh, Martha confronted her about a few things that, from, from her past um, and to do with their family. And essentially told Esther to get out of the house, um, which, you yeah, know, she might have done to save her, she might not have done, who knows, who can tell, sometimes I can't tell with her either, she's a strange one, okay, so we're going to carry on with chapter 17, and we are back into the perspective of Mr Parker, chapter 17, the discovery of a terrifying overprotective magic circle in the same room where a man had died in mysterious circumstance meant that by morning Michael Parker was still in the office and it didn't look like he'd be leaving any time soon. Working through the night was challenging enough but the events of the previous evening had been rough and he felt exhausted both physically and mentally. One thing that had become apparent was that William Ford's death was not quite as accidental as the police had ruled. Either the old bastard had bitten off more than he could magically chew, or he'd been murdered. Likely both. Neither was a pleasant thought. As professional as he would remain during the investigation, there was no getting away from the fact that Parker personally knew that a young woman who had come to them seeking answers for her father's strange death, and cared deeply about getting her the clothes as she sought. It changed things. It was bound to. An hour earlier, he'd gotten a text message from Walsh, letting him know that Amanda was going to be staying with him at his house, and that her sister was going to be handling the Empire stuff from that point forward. Parker wasn't sure how he felt about that, especially when another message quickly came through after the first, casually warning him that Martha could be rather scary when she wanted to be. Something had changed during the hours since he departed the Ford home. Something had happened and it changed things dramatically. It didn't surprise him that Martha was stepping up and taking charge after what they'd discovered in Mr Ford's study. She'd always been headstrong and tenacious, but there was also a newfound attachment within her that Parker couldn't help but find jarring. The girl that she'd been before she was taken was gone, and it was hard not to still mourn the loss even though she was there and he could physically see and speak to her again. As if the universe had taken a special note of him thinking of a remarkable woman of heartbreak and loss, Olivia suddenly swept into his office like a tall, blonde whirlwind, without so much as knocking or announcing her presence in a way that might have been taken as polite, and less abrupt than overdramatically slamming the pictures that he'd emailed her upon his desk and emphatically stating, God damn, I hate you. Good morning to you too, Liv, he sighed, rubbing the base of his skull to attempt to alleviate the tired headache that it formed. What the hell have you gone and dragged me into? He raised an eyebrow, a rush of interest perking him up quicker than any shot of coffee might. You know something? Of course I know something, she retorted sarcastically. Do you think I'd be standing there at the arse end of, at the arse end of dawn, looking like such a hot mess if I hadn't been up all night researching the hell out of this thing for you? Give me some credit. Parker had the good sense not to even attempt to answer that question. Even though he thought she looked gorgeous with her hair loose and tousled as if she'd run her hands through it often through the night and not even hint of makeup on her face, he knew better than to tell her that he believed it physically impossible for her to be anything than utterly stunning. Whatever she did or didn't wear, her mother was an Australian beauty queen turned fashion mogul and her father was a man who looked like he was still in his 40s despite being 59. The genetic odds were well and truly stacked in her favour. Parker also knew that he hadn't stayed up that she hadn't stayed up all night for him, but because the magic that had used, been used was so powerful and unique that it had intrigued her, and that she always got cranky as hell when she was tired, hence why she was lashing out. It wasn't personal. Instead of mentioning any of that though, he asked, What did you find out? It was a something circle. 
The victim summoning something he suddenly deduced, unable to decide whether he should be shocked or disgusted. The dead man was not magically gifted, nor had he expressed an interest in the occult. Quite the opposite. He had no right drawing magical circles on the ground of his study and summoning things that could and likely didn't like being conjured up by an adept, an inept, ignorant fool. Olivia nodded. He did. Do you have any idea what? Now that's the kicker in all of this, she admitted discontentedly, her shoulders slumping in defeat. I have an idea of what he perhaps intended to summon, but I can't be certain. The circle's so obscure I've never seen anything like it. I only concluded what I did by breaking it down piece by piece and trying to understand the logic between each room present and the method that he used. Okay, Parker nodded. You want to walk me through it? Do you have a spare nine hours? Okay, point taken. How about you try and summarise it instead? With a trademark smirk, she stated, We already suspect that the circle was created, or at least manipulated, by two different people, one who created it and the person or entity that warded it afterwards. My theory still fits with all of that. Shifting through the picture, she pulled out one that showed the whole summoning circle and placed it in the middle of the desk between them, indicating with a pointed finger what she referred to. The entire circle was originally drawn much more simply. The pentagram in the middle is standard fare. You can find the law for that in almost any magical textbook. It's primary school stuff. The three circles get progressively more and more complex as they go. I doubt the person drawing it even knew what those layers meant. The melee identified what they believed the symbols represented and ignored the rest. She inhaled angrily. It's sloppily done at best. Amanda recognised the circle, Parker informed her. She told Walsh that she dreamed about it six years ago and then shared the information with her father. I believe that he researched it and then tried to use it, but she doesn't even know what it was for. A quick tilt of her head indicated that Olivia agreed with his burgeoning theory, but she emphatically stated, well, his research sucked. How come? Because he didn't know what the hell he was doing, she said, somewhat sardonically. That much is painfully clear by the way that he drew it out and completely botched the incantations. They're reversed in places, incomplete in others. I assume your precognitive friend only had a vague image because he's so badly bashed together and he amended her picture to get what he thought he wanted. Walsh only said that Amanda saw it and shared it with her father. Olivia made a noise of disgust, muttering, Amateurs. Parker wasn't sure if she referred to their lack of information or the dead man's magical ineptitude, but he didn't ask. She'd always set her standards, and only she knew when and why someone or something annoyed her. He'd given up trying to guess long ago. So, he said, getting back on track. We and Ford most likely drew the circle, either copying exactly or taking inspiration from an image that his daughter gave him six years ago. Why did it take him so long to use it? Why was his research that sloppy, that hashed together? Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. If his research was that sloppy, that hashed together, it wouldn't have taken so much time, surely. Why only use it now? Olivia shrugged. I can't answer that, but I can tell you that he was trying to summon what he was trying to summon and what I think likely killed him. Go on, he urged nervously. I believe, going off some of the symbols that I was able to identify, that he summoned a demon. Her arms protectively folded across her chest as if she was afraid to say it. A real nasty one. Oh, was about all that Parker could muster in response. He'd never been religious, never believed in God or heaven and therefore the devil or hell. By proxy, he didn't think that he'd ever believed in demons. Monsters, fiends, ghosts, he believed in them because he'd seen them with his own eyes. Seen the destruction they were capable of. Anything else was a possibility, but he needed more than a possibility, more than conjecture. He believed in what he could see or fail in that what he'd experienced firsthand. Everything else was still a myth, until suddenly it was I know what you're thinking, Olivia stated. Demons? Really? Something like that. We've been doing this shit for so long it amazes me we can still throw you. Well, throw us both, she shrugged, unfurling her arms, visibly shaking out her involuntary reaction off like it was a cobweb, clinging to her limbs. Once rid of the icky feeling, she paused and smiled coyly. Plus, you know, I think it's cute seeing you ruffled and flattered, Parker replied dryly knowing that it was a tried and true coping mechanism that she developed. Moving on, he pondered. 
What would make a person summon a demon? Greed, personal grudge, simply being a sick fuck who gets his kicks messing around with shit he shouldn't. Why does anybody do something they know is inherently evil? There's something wrong with them, and sadly there are very dark sections of the occult that cater to every kind of loom ball. After a moment she softly, softly added, I'm sorry to be the bearer of such bad news. I know how much all of this must mean to you, how difficult it must be. I just want it over, he admitted. They're really good people, that whole family. They don't deserve to be going through this. Olivia smiled, wryly. Not what I meant. I'm not talking about that, Parker retorted, meeting her astute, beautiful green eyes and holding her gaze. Especially not with you. After what was far too long a moment, she said, <laughs> Spoil sport. Can we just focus on the investigation, he asked, knowing and appreciating that she was trying her best not to make the whole thing more awkward than it needed to be. The problem here was not Olivia's problem. It never had been. But there she was stood, a physical reminder of how deeply personal this whole mess was. Thankfully, she didn't take any offence, stating, Well, going forward, there are a couple of things we can do. Both of them risky, involving a lot of magic, and the reason I hate you this morning. Such as, well... I could try and break through the warding spell so that I can fix the mess that your victim left behind. It's risky, and I don't know what or who warded it afterwards, and going off my theory alone, it could leave me exposed to a counterattack by something that's already proven itself to be deadly. What's the second plan, he asked, not at all keen on that first suggestion. There was no way he was going to let, let her put herself in danger like that, but we would find another way, any other way. We go right to the source, she said very succinctly, although she was not happy about it. Unsurprising, given that it was no better than the first. It might have even been worse. And by that, you of course mean summoning whatever nasty demon the victim did and eliminating it. Parker drew in a deep breath and let all the information run through his mind. If you were to believe Olivia's theory, then what came through that summoning circle was not only bad news but the worst of all bad things he'd ever even heard of. He and the team at Empire brought real-life human people to justice for using magic to hurt other real-life human people, putting unhappy violent spirits that targeted people he cared about to rest. He'd seen that happen too. Gladly assisted the process even. Olivia was right in saying that over the years they'd both worked at Empire, they'd seen so much and done so much. Could they do this now? Raising his eyes, he asked her, how do you kill a demon? Exorcism, a voice from the doorway. A voice came from the doorway, making both of their attention shoot over in that direction. And the woman that was standing there, arms folded across her chest, looking mightily pissed off with the whole world. Stabbing them in the side of the throat also works, I guess. But that tends to depend on what kind of demon it is. Martha? Martha, Olivia repeated in a tone that was half jovial greeting, half sardonic taunting. Great. Wonderful. This was going to be fun. Last time I checked, the visitor said, not missing a beat, came to tell you that I've cleared the house because I wasn't comfortable with my family staying there. Amanda's with Walsh and my mother's being taken care of elsewhere. I have spare keys if you need access. Thanks, Parker said in response. That was sensible. Olivia turned towards the door rather earnestly saying, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I uh, should have suggested that, la that last night. I just thought that it would be alright to leave it untouched. Shit. Sorry. Martha shrugged her apology off. You didn't know at the time. An implication hung in the air that while it was true Olivia had been working on little information, the other woman had known to get her family somewhere safe, where there wasn't a summoning circle that had already been used to once to bring death into their lives. Parker couldn't blame her actions in the cold light of morning, now that they knew they were likely dealing what they were likely dealing with, but he was worried about what led her to the conclusion. Because even though she changed into more casual clothing, she held herself as if she was exhausted, hadn't slept, and appeared to have injured her face, which was bruised and slightly cut along the cheekbone. Resisting the urge to ask what happened was a battle hard fought and marginally won, but he knew that it could likely wait. Again, there were more important questions, like how the hell she knew how to kill a demon. What was that about? Before he could ask, however, Martha started talking to Olivia directly, as if they were the only two people in the room. I'm sure you are aware by now that my sister saw the circle in one of her visions. 
I believe that my father took the drawings and researched it. There were books in his study that caught my eye last night when I dropped my shield and there wasn't chance to look through them after we uncovered the circle. You might learn something there that can help you narrow things, things down further before we try anything as drastic as exorcism. I have a feeling you like to be prepared. Thanks, the other woman sounded genuinely surprised. I'll do that today. Hopefully we can find out a bit more about what he did. Martha nodded. Also, I don't know if it occurred to you or not, but the man who made the circle was a null, magically. We shouldn't have been able to access magic at all, let alone conjure it up enough to get something like that to work. I'm no expert, so please forgive me if I'm not getting this right, but wouldn't somebody of limited ability need a focus or some kind of something to use to conjure to use the power that they were conjuring up you're right the pagan nodded enthusiastically eyes widening widening as if she was extremely impressed by the knowledge being shared and wanted to match it with her own they'd need a charm or some form of talisman or amulet a trinket it wouldn't need to be much just something that's been blessed by someone with real power so that the novice practitioner can then use it as a proxy a necklace Parker asked, staring at the bulletin board that held the police reports and images from the crime scene across the room. Yeah, a necklace would suffice. Following his eye line, Olivia inquired, Why? What are you... He crossed over to, the, over to the board and pointed out what caught his eye, pointing at an image of the dead man in his tragically prone position on the driveway. He said, Something like that? Olivia came to stand next to him, unintentionally bisecting the space between him and Martha, who was still stood in the doorway, looking more than a little bit pensive. She scrutinised the photograph before excitedly nodded. Oh, that's it. That is it. I'll put a call in and see if it's being kept as evidence, Parker stated, lifting his attention to the other woman. He added, I assume you think that we need it, if we're going to correct what, we, what he did. She shrugged noncommittally. Not my expert, not my area of expertise. And yet, you are spot on again. It's spot on again, Olivia stated, unconvinced. I'm not sure having it will give us any clues as to what kind of demon this charming, fe charming fellow summoned. But if we can find out where it came from, who it came from, and then maybe it will help me understand the magic that was used. Or at least converse with the person who can. During their investigation, the police gathered a lot of William Ford's known business associates, Parker suggested, crossing the room again and returning to his desk. Amanda's expanded upon the list when she spoke to Maxwell. I'd say there's a pretty good chance that he used somebody who knew to buy the necklace. Amulet. Amulets are predominantly for protection, Olivia stated, as a matter of fact. God only knew she liked to show off. How she was much more than a pretty face, but there was no bravado in her th that morning. I doubt he had the sense to ask for protective spells, even if the magical protect uh, practitioner who blessed it for him threw them in for free. It was used by proxy to give him much ma enough magic to create the summoning circle. If he won an appropriate name for it, talisman's probably better. Talisman, he repeated. It looks antique, so it's safe to assume that he came by it through one of his contacts. We find out who they are, then we might be able to find out something about the spells he used. Anything's possible. Parker found the file that he'd been looking for. The list was long and extensive, a fact that equally depressed and invigorated him. While he liked it when an investigation opened up, he could see that it was going to be another long, hard, grueling day. The moment he looked up from the list directly, in, directly into a pair of copper eyes that he knew far, far too well, he forgot any hesitancy he might have been feeling, though. If Martha could, with all of her attachments and traumatic history, put her emotions aside and focus on getting her sister the answers that she sought, so could he. Holding out her hand, she asked him, May I see? Sure, he responded, handing it over, though he wasn't sure what she was going to make of the names on it. Surely her sister would be the best person to ask, simply for the fact that she'd been there, living in the same house as the victim around the time he died. She'd know better than anyone who he had recent dealings with. However, Martha seemed to spot something on the list that struck a chord with her because she nodded and said, I know where we should start. That is, if you don't mind me getting involved. She seemed to leave the question hanging in the air, not aimed at anyone in particular. It was Parker who answered, All right, Liv, thoughts? I want to go and take another look at the summoning circle, the blonde pagan stated. If I'm going to end up trying to crack it, I need to understand the magic better. 
get a feel for it. It'd be great if you can find the practitioner who blessed the talisman, but I can't rely on that. If you can't find them, I'm going to need every bit of information that I can get before we proceed. I'm not doing any of this blindly. Parker nodded, know very well how Livia operated, the lengths she often went to to protect herself from the things that she was going to battle against. It was an admirable trait, and he couldn't fault her for her caution now, especially not if, not if it involved something as potentially awful and deadly as a demon. Call Walsh and have him go with you, he instructed. He's not going to want to get involved, but I'm not having you work in that house alone, and he's the only other person I know is powerful enough to counter anything mystical or magical if something goes wrong. Tell him he can sit in the hallway if he has to, and if he has any problems with it, he can take it up with me. Even though Olivia inevitably rolled her eyes and made a small and happy noise about his overprotectiveness, she conceded, Fine. Play nice, he warned her, knowing them both too well. Of course, she sounded genuinely offended. Gathering her files off the desk, she gave him one last long look that seemed to say far, far too much and not nearly enough. Something the two of them had seemingly perfected over the years. And then she turned and left the office, departing with a far too fanciful, Have fun, you two. Once Olivia was gone, Parker again felt a pressure that he hadn't known was there eased from his chest. It was ridiculous, and because he knew that he couldn't keep happening every time the three of them were in the same room, he said to Martha, Go ahead. Ask. Hmm? She replied, seemingly disinterested, as she continued to acutely scan the names that were printed on the list in her hand. Olivia. What about her? After a few seconds, she finally raised her eyes to meet his, giving him the impression that she was confused. Did I just professionally step on her toes or something? No, he answered, perhaps a little too quickly. No, while we do often work together, more often work together than not, she prefers to do her things her own way. Then what's the problem? You don't... He shook his head, admonishing himself for assuming that she had any recognition of or strong feelings about the underlying tension that had made the two previous meaning, meetings awkward for him. With flustered resignation, he stated, I guess it doesn't matter. Just thought we might need to talk about some things. Martha shrugged, cast her eyes back down to the page of names in her slender hands. We've already talked. And that's all, he concluded. That's all. Parker couldn't deny that the outcome made him feel unhappy, but if that was what Martha wanted, that, that is how it would be. He knew her far too well to expect her to want to talk about something she had zero interest in, and while she changed in many ways, he doubted that that was one of them. He wouldn't push for a conversation she wasn't prepared to have and risk causing her to become defensive in response, not when they had work to do. He didn't know if working alongside his one-time girlfriend was going to be healthy for them professionally or otherwise. But she seemed to have some really good insights, and her instincts were as sharp as they'd ever been before. Besides, she seemed to have asserted herself into the investigation, and he wasn't about to tell her that she wasn't welcome, recalling his young friend psychic, young psychic friend's warning that she'd already displayed some pretty scary displays of anger in the past 12 hours since he'd left her alone with her sister. Martha was determined to fix the mess that her father had left behind in the wake of his death, and woe betide anybody that got in her way. Parker was not prepared to put himself in that spot. They needed all the help that they could get, and she was more than up to it. So, he said, getting back on track. Where are we going first? <laughs> Where indeed? I was going to read two chapters today, but I'm not. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to be really cruel, and I'm going to leave it there. Um, that was a lot more involved than I thought that it was going to be. Uh, yeah, it's been strange because... I. Oh, I don't know, it's been a good year or so probably since I've read through that book in preparation for the final work that I was doing on the second book. And yeah, some of the chapters are really quite involved. So yeah, it's nice reading through them again. And it's nice uh, for me as well, seeing where some of these characters started off Um in hindsight because I'm quite far down the road and I know that they're somewhere quite different <laughs> so where and how they've started off it's, it's really really fun to read it back with you and um and yeah I am excited to read more but we're not going to do it right now because I think that that's enough for today um thank you as always for listening 
Uh, we will be back tomorrow. And I hope that everybody has a really good day. I hope you take care of yourselves and you're doing whatever you need to do to get through um, here in the UK. We've, uh, we've got another three weeks of lockdown and coming off the back of, I don't know how many weeks, is it three weeks, four weeks now, five weeks? I, d I, I don't even know anymore. Um, yeah, it can seem like, uh, it, that can seem like a long time, but you know we keep busy and find things to do then then we'll get through it i realized this is completely off topic um i realized yesterday somebody mentioned to me that the sonic the hedgehog movie only came out on february the 14th of this year which valentine's day of this year and me and my son went to see it on the opening day because he's a really big sonic fan and i used to be a really big sonic fan when when i was a kid so we went to see it on opening day and that was on Valentine's Day nine weeks ago and it feels like a freaking lifetime ago. I heard, when I heard someone mention that it was on Valentine's Day, I was like, no, that's not right. That was like last year. <laughs> now it was only nine weeks ago. So yeah, yeah, time has no meaning anymore. So, But tomorrow we will be back for more Sins of the Father. So thank you, as always, for listening. And I'll see you then.